Moro Moro and welcome back to Culinary Roleplaying. I'm into how it plays, a show where we will take a look at tabletop roleplaying game. I will give you a quick overview of the system, then we will take a little peek at the character creation and how characters are created and characters will be demonstrated by our returning heroes, our frost mage Valanor and our guardian blade master Takino. And after that we will have a short one-shot adventure using the system so you can see actually how the game plays. And while you're here, if you're enjoying this kind of show, leave a subscription, that will always help the channel. And if you feel that you are ready to become a real adventurer, you can always join the Culinary Role Playing Guild. And today's system is a system that I actually acquired quite recently myself. So I have now read the rules and I have played the game a little bit. So it's still quite fresh for me as well. But I needed to talk about this system. First of all, personally, I am a fan of anime. I have watched anime throughout my life and still am watching different shows from time to time. But I want to underline, don't let the anime aesthetic fool you because OVA, the anime role-playing game, has become probably one of my top five table of role-playing games. And I think it is a wonderful, wonderful game to play solo. So the name OVA comes from original video animation, which means in anime contexts, all the, basically, also like spin-offs, movies, and extra content from different kinds of animations that were directly developed and created for home screens like with from video and dvd and blu-ray and all that stuff so these are contents that didn't have any like official television release so most often these were like uh, original spin-off films of different anime series or uh, original like extra episodes that were created just like to be this kind of dlc if you may but because they are also like really tight, like they usually are like only like under 10 episodes most of the time. They have a really tight budget and they were also a medium that people tried like different original ideas as well. And I think the name OVA to this table of role-playing game comes that you are creating your original video animation at home for your own home screen or the home group. So that's why I think they adapted the name. It's a game about anime tropes, but in its core, it is a wonderful universal role-playing system that can create any kind of genre you, you want. I have always loved the idea that GURPS and uh, Open D6 and Mini 6 and a Hero System and all these other very crunchy universal TTRPGs have. I'm talking about the idea of point system. These systems try to codify the world and the powers and the abilities of every character, every structure, every like battleship. So you can have, using the same aspects, you can either build a character or you could build a battleship. And character strength would be like 15 and battleship strength would be like 1500. And it's like you have the you have the same aspects and the scale is just huge, but you can basically create everything using the same codified aspects. But the biggest sin of GURPS, Hero System, uh, Open D6, these games become really crunchy, really easily, and therefore they are very difficult to use in solo. I know there are people who use, for example, GURPS, in solo, which can work, especially if you are familiar with GURPS. I think it's quite easy for you to just play and build the things you need as you go. But for a person like me who really hasn't like sunk their teeth into these systems, it can be really daunting to start to learn them and especially try to like haphazardly use them in solo. And this is where OVA comes in. I think this is a system that simplifies all the aspects of like different characters, different items into basically 
abilities and disadvantages. So everything is created by using these abilities. Your enemies, your friends, your items, all that. And it is, it has enough crunchiness to keep it interesting, but it, it is still much more narrative and loose compared to, for example, GURPS, which is very like simulationist and gamified. With this perfect combination of having a little bit of gaming elements and narrative systems, and a system where you can easily create things on the spot when you start to just master the system a little bit. I will say it requires a little bit of system mastery to really like know all the abilities that you can really start to make the game sing. But I have now played maybe two games of it and I already feel like the flow is really good. So here we have Takino's character sheet and as you can see this is basically everything mechanical that the character has. We have abilities and weaknesses. And abilities, like really, they include your attributes, your character's skills, your character's special abilities, hence the name. All the aspects that give your character an edge in some situation, they are all abilities. Then we have weaknesses, which are the opposite of abilities. So. These are the areas that your character is lacking and when these weaknesses become relevant, they will be utilized against you. So how does this system work? It is a really simple dice system. It is quite original one. Another system that comes close to this system is probably games like the Broken Compass and Outgunned. So very similar to Broken Compass and Outgunned in a sense that it is a d6 dice pool system, but with a lack of better name, I would call it a Yatsi system. So during the game, when our character wants to do something that is opposed somehow, that is risky, that is something that the success of that action is not guaranteed, they will need to make an action roll. And the action roll starts with 2d6. That is the base amount of your dice pool. Then we will take into account the character's abilities and weaknesses. If it's something that we have some kind of ability that would help us, we can add the level of the ability as dice. So if we would have ability level 3, we could add 3 dice and so forth. Same thing with weaknesses. But the base is always like you start from 0, that's 2 dice. If you would have minus 1 dice, that would mean that you roll 3 and you pick the lowest dice. Or you pick the lowest result. Let's take an example for Takino. Takino is walking within the forest and he gets this unnerving sensation that something bad is about to happen. Takino tries to figure out if there is an ambush waiting for him. So I could argue that our intuitive ability would be of use for us here. So then we would take the base 2 die and then add our intuitive level, which is 2. We would add another 2 die. So now we would have a dice pool of four dice. And now the game master, or if you play alone yourself, can decide either if there is some active enemy that tries to get you, you could make this an opposed roll where the enemy will also roll the dice. But for now, let's make it just standard action roll. And the difficulty scale is from two to 12. An average roll is six. So let's say it's a standard difficult roll. Let's try to aim for six. Now we will roll the dice and see what kind of results we get. This is actually a really good first example. We got four different results. We got two, three, four and six. Now, when all the dice are individual, we will pick the highest dice because we didn't have any penalties. So that would mean our score would be 6 and we would succeed. Now, why is it called a Yatsi system? So on a base level, we will pick the highest score. But if we would have gotten score 2, 4, 4, 6, and now we have two fours, all the matching dice actually go together and you sum them up and they become a new score. So now we would actually have 2, 6 and 8, which means 8 would be our best result. So you will always only add up the same numbers together. And let's make this even crazier. If we would have rolled 4, 4, 4, 6, even then we would take 
all the fours and add them together and this would be 12. And that's why I call it the Yatsi system. You always put the same numbers together and they basically like morph into each other and become the one score. When your modifier is negative, so let's say that we wouldn't get the intuitive roll and then there it's misty outside and, and the ambushers are invisible. I would say, okay, now it's minus, with minus two penalty. And if we would not get intuitive to that, that would mean the modifier would be minus two. In that case, we would again roll four dice because plus minus two. So meaning we will add a die for every negative modifier. But this time we will pick the lowest result. But remember, even here, you will put the numbers together. So for example, if we would get a result of five, six, two, two, these two become four. And that means the four is the lowest result. We will take that. Or we could get five, five, six, two. Then we would have 10, six and two. And the two is the lowest result. So we will take the two. So as you can see, very simple system. And when you are directly opposed by someone, it is an opposing role. And the highest score wins. Pretty simple. Combat is pretty interesting. On its core, really simple. It is the attack pool versus the defense pool. And if the attacker gets a higher score than the defender, the attacker wins and deals damage. And if the defender wins, they manage to dodge or parry or block the blow. But what's interesting, you also create your attacks and moves using the abilities. And you normally usually pick an attack ability, which determines the amount of damage your attack will do. And if you want to play it simple, you can just leave it at that. You will have the damage modifier, then you probably take a few other abilities that will better your attack and defense results, and then you can just play. But what you can do, you can cre basically create these move sets that you can use during combat. For example, I have here created move set the way of the Blade Master for Takino. And how it works? It all starts from zero endurance. Endurance is basically your stamina, your mana and your energy that your character has. So here we have basically like a basic attack. The attack roll is four, meaning we will roll four dice. DX means damage modifier and our damage modifier is four. This means when we roll for the attack, we will compare that result to the defender's defense score. For example, if I rolled the 4d12, and I got now, okay, I got six. Yeah, actually, yeah, because three, three is six also. So yeah, we got six. And let's say our enemy rolled a four. That means I beat the enemy score by two. And now when the basic attacks damage modifier is four, I will deal two times four damage to the enemy, meaning eight damage. And that's the basics. Then the game also introduces perks and flaws into your abilities. And these also include stuff that you can add to your attacks. So now we take the basic attack and create another attack for our combat set. So I have created the Master Cut. It has the stats of accurate, armor plus barrier pierce. So it has armor pierce and barrier pierce. And then it has effective. Accurate, really simple. You just add one additional die to your attack roll. Effective, really simple, you just add plus one to the damage modifier. And then we have armor and barrier pierce. There is ability called armored, which means that you will reduce the attacker's damage modifier equal to your, your armored score. So if we would use our basic attack and the enemy has ability armored two, that means we would reduce our damage modifier two, two. And basically armor pierce just penetrates that. So now because it was a basic attack, it doesn't cost any endurance. But now when we have added additional perks to the attack, it now starts to cost endurance from our character. So we can add these extra buffers and modifiers to our attacks, but then it will basically like cost stamina points. So it will de de deplete our endurance. But then you can also take flaws that will reduce the cost of the attacks. It becomes this interesting game of how many perks you can take and how much endurance, how, many, how powerful attack you want to make and what flaws you can take to the attack to reduce the endurance cost just a little bit. 
and how many floors you can take to pump up the attack to be even more devastating. And this is beauty of the system. It can become really detailed if you want. It, it can be extremely detailed if you want to put some nitty gritty, especially for your own characters, but it doesn't have to be. And it works really well without it. You can just ignore this whole special attack thing and just use the attack of free and just add it to your damage modifier and be done with it. And because it is so open and it also uses all the abilities, you don't have to make it a combat system. You could easily make this uh, kind of like Ace Attorney game where you all play these different lawyers who have like these objection abilities or anything like that. And you can basically create the combat to be this kind of judge hall panther between the defendant and the accuser. And that's why I'm so excited about it because it is the system works really well. And also the abilities. The abilities can be really deep on the detail, like what they will give you. Like for example, we have ability Magic Arcane, which basically tells you that with a certain amount of cost, you can create any other abilities effects if you just have the enough endurance to pay for it. So you don't have to take the flight ability. You can just take this Arcane Magic ability and just cast a spell that will give you the flight ability, for example. And we have abilities like transformation, which is basically like if you want to, for example, have, well, if you want to create an Iron Man who gets his iron suit on and you just want to be like street level Tony Stark, uh, this kind of philanthropist, millionaire scientist, you can be that. And then you can just take the transformation ability that gives you, that gives you for a certain situations a certain amount of time like upgraded ability levels and then you can basically have the armor come to you and then you can be the iron man so it can be really detailed but again these are things that you won't necessarily need in your game like i enjoy that the details are there if you need them but you don't have to not every not every game uses all the abilities not every adventure has vehicle mecha ability, for example. Not all the games have magic. So it's really easy to just pick the things you want and not pick anything at all if you don't want. So it's really easy to just pick and choose the things you will need in your adventure. And like we said, there are many things that the abilities can tell you in detail what they can do, but also you can just use the name in the situation. For example, like the intuitive. I feel like it is an ability that will help us to determine if we are going to be ambushed or not. And that's the idea of the game. It, the abilities just give you the roundabout idea what the abilities give you, but it's still highly dependent on the narrative, on the context. So that's why it's so free and you don't have to really stress about it. It won't break the game because it is not that fixated, detailed into the simulation where you like you have all the options and you have to use them basically to make the game work. This is very loose and narrative. You don't have to necessarily use the abilities into the point. And if you want enemies in your games, making encounters and NPCs is really simple. We have overall TV for our characters, which means threat value. And threat value basically comes from all the extra abilities that give you more health, more endurance, more defense, Oh, the defense, by the way, it's the amount of dice you will roll to defend yourself. But yeah, all the extra dice that we get to defense and attacks, it's basically, they all sum up to be our threat value. And then you take the average of your character's threat value, which is when Ta Takino is 13, Valano is 11, that becomes 12 by the average. Then we can just add it the level shot to here. So dead even would be 12 because that would be the same. And then we just divide and add the number of TV we want to our encounter to have. And here also the book introduces the idea of creating NPCs and basically how it works. We can have extras, which are basically characters that have 10 health and 10 endurance on the base and 
around plus one or plus two to all their abilities. Then we have secondary characters that have endurance of 20 each and then they can have plus two to three on their different abilities. Then we have can, can have heroic NPCs which are start to be on bar with the player characters and then we can have bosses that are these big threatful villains. And then there is also a little bit rules how to make like bigger enemies. It's really simple. If you have enemies which threat value which threat value is equal to the heroes, they are gonna be dead even, which means the battle can go either way. So that is all already like a deadly encounter. Like in every other game, action economy is important. So I would advise for you to if you make a big boss, give the boss actions equal to the number of players minus one. So if you would have three player characters, give the big boss, if it's like the, if the enemies, if the players are fighting only one character, give the big boss like two actions. So then the players have the number advantage, but it doesn't get too heavy. And other way around, when, when the players are fighting small minions, keep the action economy in a way that enemies don't have over three actions over the players. So if you would have two player characters, three minor enemies would be like already quite enough. Four starts to be kind of crazy. Five, even with weaker enemies, that can be really serious already. Because having three extra actions is uh, quite a huge, huge advantage, even though they would be really weak enemies. So keep that in mind. Making like fast enemies is really easy. When you have the enemy threat value budget, think of these as points that you can give the characters. For example, here I have made a moderate extra. The stats of the extra character started from 10 and they have maximum ability of two. It is a moderate enemy. We have six points to use. I used a few points to add some extra health, some extra endurance. I added extra damage modifier. I gave one skilled bandit ability, which means like all the skills relating to banditry. So if they would make that ambush for Takino, I would roll with three dice. Then I also added one combat skill, which means now they can make a weapon attack accurate with melee. So now it meant I wanted to create a general attack for the bandit, which means both melee and ranged. I just make attack with the weapon, it gets accurate one. So now it's an attack with four dice and three damage modifier. Really, really simple to make basic enemies from the air. And the more familiar you are with the system and the more abilities you know by heart, the more varied and more easier it will be to make the characters. Because all the rules are same for both players and the characters. And you will always use the, all the universal abilities. But that is the beauty you can start playing this today and have a good flow within the game even though you won't know all the abilities by heart. But the more you play and the more abilities you get to know, the more you will get also out of the system. It is really a system that keeps on giving after every playtime. And that's why I feel like it would be criminal to, to say that yeah, it's a really good anime game. Yeah, it is a good anime game, but I think it's a wonderful universal role-playing system as well. And you don't have to use the anime tropes at all. And that's what we are going to test today. We are going to have our adventure with Takino and Valano and see how it will go. I think that's that. That's everything about the system. All the things work the same way. You will just get additional dice and make narratively interesting things. And in today's adventure, we are going to use blood unfolding machine again as our oracle to help us tell the epic story of Takino and Valano. And I really think today we are closing in to an epic conclusion for the story of Takino and Valano. I feel like after today's episode, if both of them are alive, <laughs> assuming, you know, anything can happen when you play solo tabletop role-playing games. But assuming they survive for today, I feel like the next adventure would be basically the culmination of their adventure. So I'm probably going to make this kind of epic extra adventure, which is the grand conclusion of the adventures of Takino and Valano. And then 
the next time we will have how it plays, it will be probably some other heroes maybe and some other story. We will think about that when we get there. But we, without further ado, let's get into today's solo demonstration with Takino and Valano. Last time during our adventures with Takino and Valano, this adventuring duo were still trapped within the realm of corruption. Within the realm of corruption, Takino and Valano tried to find their way back into their own realm, the Trial Lands. Within the realm of corruption, they found and infiltrated the castle of the Lord of Corruption, the ruler of the whole corruption realm, which we determined together with the few oracle roles that not only the Lord of Corruption is a vampire, he also has an army of dedicated cultists that are ready to lay down their life for their master and basically worship the Lord of Corruption as this kind of god. And while they found Realm Gate, they also discovered the horrifying plan of the Lord of Corruption. He's been using Realm Gates to go into different realms as well and spread his corruptive influence into another realms and bit by bit taking them over. And by destroying the original corruption that Lord of Corruption had planted to Trial Lands, Takino and Valano know that their home has now become a priority target for the Lord of Corruption. So I think these two, when they jumped into the Realm Gate from within the Realm of Corruption, they appeared somewhere here near the Tower of Secrets. Somewhere deep within this mountainside there were, there were hidden an old ancient Realm Gate that brought them back into their own home. But they have not much time. They know that the Lord of Corruption will try to invade their home with full force. And I think Takino and Valano both realize that the best option right now is to try to get into Brightham. Brightham is basically this kind of defensive, defensive center of the Trial Lands. It has the most fortified fortress and occupies the most amount of troops within this land. So if they would get into Brightham in time and convince the local lord that imminent threat is upon them, they might be able to gather enough troops to fight off and defend their home against this corruption. So I think we can create this kind of small exposition where Takino and Valano have now traveled few days, sleeping restless nights, basically going through the forest and are now closing into the town of Worm Mill. And their idea is to quickly just pass through Worm Mill, maybe get some kind of transportation that will bring them to Brightham as soon as possible. But when they arrive into Worm Mill, it seems that the corruption has already made its welcome. And that's where we start today. Our today's quest is venture your way through the town of Worm Mill. And in addition to that, hopefully we can find some kind of transportation that will take these two to the Brightham as quickly as possible. I think these two are closing in into the edge of the forest. They are beaten, they are tired, they haven't slept well in multiple days, they haven't eaten well, and they just have been going day by day. Just keep going, keep walking, keep running, because the threat is even more prominent than any tiredness and exhaustion they feel right now. Wandering through the woods, Takino can finally see the edge of the forest and he shouts to Valano, Valano, I can see the edge of the forest. We are closing into Worm Mill. We'll be there before night. Valano, who usually always comes back with, with the one-liner or two for every occasion, is just dead silent. And Takino has to even check check up on them to see if they are even there anymore. And yes, they can see Valano. Valano is just like barely holding their eyes open and just says, <laughs> okay, great, we are almost there. Takino watches his friend with a concerned look, but he thinks to himself that there is no time for that right now. They need to keep going. 
because even their hometown, Emberbine Pike, can be in big danger. And as they come closer to the edge of the forest and the landscape opens before them and they can see the fields and the plains that surround Wormmill, additionally they can see big black smoke coming from the center of the town. And Takino just says, oh no. And he basically takes a few running steps to the edge of the forest. And Valano even startles a little bit as well. And <laughs> runs behind Takino as well. When they both arrive to the edge of the forest, they can see the town of Wormmill engulfed in flames. They can hear these distant screams of townsfolk. They can hear these ever so slightly small clashes of plates and metal. They realize that the army of corruption is already there. <sighs> Valano, we have to hurry. There might be still people alive there. <sighs> You're right, Valano. <sighs> okay, lead the way. Just a second. <gasps> oh, okay. Okay, I'm ready now. Let's go. And they both just jump onto the road that leads to Worm Mill and keep on going into the center of the conflict. And this will definitely lead us into the first scene and we can make an expectation checker from Blood Unfolding Machine. So our my expectation right now is that they will arrive into the burning town. There will be buildings burning and they will try to do anything to help the townspeople to get things under control. There might be some enemies, there might be some other troubles, We'll see. But that is the expectation right now. Number two, there is a complication. Before they can even get into the town, there is a complication. Makes sense. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Here we have complication table. So let's take a D10 plus a D20 and see what the complication is. Nine. Information. 16. Information abandoned, useless, obsolete. What is the information that is now obsolete? I think I need some extra inspiration. Let's ask what. What is the information that is now obsolete? Let's take the type is from the 10 and the subject is from once. 7. Dangerous, five. Dangerous location. And that information is now obsolete. So it's too late. It's too late. I know what happens. Takino and Valano dart into the worm mill. It takes some time for them to finally reach into the town from the edge of the forest. It takes a few minutes. With each step, the sound of conflicts gets quieter. The sound of screams die down. And when they arrive to the edge of the town, the only thing they can hear and smell is the smoke and embers of the burning town. They carefully walk into the town just to see the pure destruction of the town. There seems to be no living soul there. Just burning buildings, destroyed walls, scattered objects, broken carts. This is horrible. It seems we were too late. Uh, well, at least I will try to do something for the flames. And we can actually try to do an arcane magic of rain. So now, how basically arcane magic ability works. Arcane magic is basically an ability where you can, using endurance, you can create other abilities. And you could basically create this magical spell book that is already ready. And you can have like all the different spells there. So you can like do work beforehand if you want. But basically you can just determine the level of the ability and compare it to the level of your, your, of your arcane magic. Now we have level two. So all the ability effects of level one could, would cost us 10. If we would do something with equal level, that would cost us 20 endurance and so forth. So creating a rain around town that would slowly die down the flames i think it's at least level two maybe even level three but i will say it's level two and i will make a roll for it 
and you can make a DC roll or then you can also make an open roll and we will do that now. So open roll is a situation where we can just roll the dice and see how well we succeeded by watching the final score. So I think this now is a situation where we can spend 20 endurance and we will use that from, let's use that from Valano's staff. Valano has also an ability that gives them additional endurance, but these can be only used to do abilities and all that stuff. Because normally endurance is also like partially your health. So if you're out of health, next you will start to lose endurance. So because we have RK Magic of two, we add the base two for it. So we will roll four dice and see how well it goes. Our first roll. Ah, not that well, but we luckily we got a pair of three, so that means it's six. So our roll result is good, which is and six is the average roll. So I would say, given a little bit of time, Valano will focus their magical powers to the staff and basically rise it up, up into the sky, and clouds start to gather around the town. And maybe after a minute, small light rain s starts to gather around the worm mill, which will not completely distinguish the flames right away, but it definitely helps that the fire doesn't spread. Takino takes a knee and just takes in the scenery, tries to see any signs of life around them both but there seems to be no one there great job well and all let's let's keep going and they both keep going into the center of town within the town center at first it seems to be dead silent but then it seems like there are two or three individuals standing next to a central statue that surrounds the worm mill worm mill was a town that was originally founded by a hero who was known as the Dragon Slayer. So in the center statue, there is this heroic statue of an individual in armor and having this kind of very magnificent looking spear and piercing through a scaly body of a wyvern. And right under that statue, they can see two or three individuals, but they seem very silent. And Takino's eyes widen a little bit and he takes a few hurried steps and reaches out his hand and is almost starting to say something like, Hey, you! But then Valanor. I want to make uh, some kind of test to Valanor because Valanor is a little bit skeptical of the situation. Valanor has telepathic and keen senses. So Valanor tries to peer into the minds of these individuals and also use their keen hearing and keen smell to see if something is up they by far they seem like regular townspeople they have like regular townsfolk attire but they are surprisingly still and they are just standing there so it is kind of iffy so i would say at least keen senses will help in this situation and i would say telepathic helps us as well so we can roll a whopping five dice but I will reduce one die because, because Valano is an airhead. So they are not that quick-witted in most cases. This is a special situation, but still this is like Takino is already engaging. So they are a little bit slow. So that's why I also take the one weakness as well, because I gave both telepathic and keen senses. So now we have four dice and I would say this is a trap set by the cultists. So let's make this an opposed roll. And it is against, let's say, moderate. L let's use this bandit, but they are like cultists. We will roll three dice. They are skilled bandits, so they are good at making ambushes. So let's see first what the bandits get, so we know what we have to roll. First roll, one, four, five. That means five is the best result. So we have to beat five with Valano. And we roll the four dice. Let's see what comes out of them. And that is two, four, three, and six. So six is the final result. 
So Valano notices something is up. Valano, with their keen senses and with their ability of telepathy, they realize when they are trying to connect into the minds of these individuals, there's nothing there. There is no mind to connect to. And their keen senses and sharp eyes, they can see that these individuals, these bodies are not moving at all, like not breathing at all. And when Takino is going and reaching out and trying to shout for these individuals, Valano has just enough time to grab a hold of Takino's shoulder and just to say to Takino, oh, Takino, just wait a second. And just in time when Valano is able to stop Takino, <laughs> a crossbow bolt comes down right next to Takino's leg. From the alley behind them and from behind crates in front of them, four individuals emerge and one of them shouts to the others, Ah, they figured it out. Well, no matter. Let's dispose of them quickly. Our Lord is waiting. And four battle-ready cultists are approaching them from all sides. Takino will pull out his sword. You will pay what you did to this town. I think we will start our combat. So like in fighting, there are some specific abilities that will help you get a better initiative. But there are also some abilities that you can argue that would help you within initiative. Okay, I will roll a shared initiative for all the enemies. So we have four moderate difficulty bandits. So let's just roll for Valano first, their initiative, see what's going on. What's up? <laughs> One and two. So two is Valano's initiative. Then let's roll for Takino. I would argue Agile gives us definitely bonus to the initiative. And I would say Sixth Sense also gives us some extra to our initiative. So we will roll, woo, we will roll four dice for Takino. Oh, and that's not... Well, <laughs> one, two, two, two. And now we add all those twos together, which means our, our score is six. And for the cultists, so they have the skilled cultist skill, I would say it's worth one die. So let's roll three for the cultists. And that is one, three, and four. So that means Takino starts... Then it's the cultists, and finally, it's Valano. So, I made a rough sketch of the surrounding areas. The combat and otherwise movement in OVA is very, like, loose. in theater of the mind combat. But it, you can work with zones if you want. So if you want to add some kind of like level of movement but it's really loose in that sense but i just created this small draft so you guys can also have the idea of what i i am visualizing right now so takino and valano are now arriving to the round square the statue and that stuff is over here so the here were the two boxes that the these two bandits were behind and they are a little bit farther away and at least one of them have crossbows we can actually ask from the oracle if both of them have crossbows. And I would say it's it's 50-50. Let's ask from the oracle. Does both of them have bows? So 10 die is the likelihood and one die is that extra spice. Three, no, and three. But I know the other one in here does not have a crossbow but it seems to be a different looking individual. This individual doesn't seem to be your, your basic combat style cultist, rather than it seems to be an individual that is a spellcaster, just like Valano. So that can be really difficult. So that can become quite a problem. But first it's Takino, and I think Takino wants to take out these most imminent threats, these mean looking cultists that have basically like i think they have like a shield and some kind of mace and the other one has like two axes in their hands and takino seems really determined to take down these people and to avenge the town's casualties with his 
weight of the plate master, agileness and fastness before even these two can realize it, he is already in the face of the first one. He focuses his blade and makes this really <laughs> faster than any normal eye can see. The only thing that everyone can see is the starting point of his hands and the end point of his hands. And then you can just basically hear this very gentle wind sound that comes from that comes from moving the blade from a space to another and i think right away takino will use some of his endurance to make a master cut so that means it is accuracy one we roll five dice for the attack it it, it has armor and barrier pierce these guys are not armored so that's not gonna have any effect but it's also effective so that means the damage modifier is five and that will cost us 15 endurance so we have 33 left and these guys had combat of one and i thought that we can also include that to defense so they will roll three dice so we have taken us five dice versus these guards three dice i will roll the defense first so then we can know how many points we do damage oh and that's not good for the guard one two three so the biggest one is three so the defense is three against Takino's attack. Let's see what happens. Here we go. Oh! I got two, two, which is four, and then I got three, 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 which is nine. So nine minus three is six, and the damage modifier was five. So six times five is 30 damage with a blow of a wind and without any sound Th Takino is right next to the first cultist and the cultist just looks like the cultist didn't have any time even put the shield before Takino's attack and just like that the ropes of the cultist just turn red and the cultist just reels back in the ground are moving. <sighs> Takino is mad. Woo wee, that was a bad hit. And now it's the cultist's turn. And I think this cultist with the crossbow comes here and tries to hit Takino with a with an attack. And this other god is also trying to get closer to Takino and make a hit in. And this cultist, I think. He starts to cast a spell that is activatable, which means it will take one more turn. But that means I can add 10 extra endurance points worth of perks to that spell, whatever they are casting. So they start to wave their hands and basically they start to carve a wound to their hand and extract their blood into spell casting. And Valano can definitely see that something is up with the caster and is trying to like figure out a spell of their own possibly to counter this attack okay but now first the crossbow bolt against takino takino's defense is four and we also have one level of armored so we will also lower the damage threshold of the enemy's attack so four defense dice against the cultist's crossbow attack of four as well so four against four let's first roll for the takino again to see the result takino rolls pretty well actually one four four and six so eight for takino and then we roll for the crossbow bolt Pff, attack oh that's pretty good as well but not enough that's six is the best because it's two, three, four, six. So six against eight is not enough. So slashing first, the coldest. With his sixth sense, he can basically hear the crossbow released. And basically with this unnatural speed, Takino just turns and basically slices with his sword, the bolt from the middle and it spreads his both sides and at the same time the other cultist with the axe ah, is coming closer and tries to attack takino and same deal 
4 against 4. Again, let's roll the Takino's defense so we can see what we have to beat. Or hopefully not beat. 1-1 one, one, which is 2, 2 which is only 2, and then we have 5. So 5 is our defense for this next roll. Defense of 5 versus 2, 3, 3, 5. So our, the enemy's attack is 6, which means our defense is, Takino's defense is beaten by 1. So now the damage modifier is 3, that would mean 3 damage. But Takino is also armored, so which means we lower the damage modifier by 1, so only 2. That means we, Takino takes 2 points of damage, which is not too much. So basically Takino cuts the bolt in half and then can see the axe coming from the side. He just basically reels back and the axe scrapes, scrapes his hand a little bit, makes this very tiny cut, but not enough to do anything major. And Takin just says, that was your final mistake. You should have aimed a little bit to the left and is ready to take out the other cultist as well. But before that, let's see what Valano tries to do in order to stop this one cultist from casting the spell. Easiest way would probably just try to cast an Ice Lance and deal some really good hits in. Because when you are using activatable ability, it's not the same as channeling. When you are channeling, it like gives you even more power, but then you can't do anything and you're very easy to hit. And if you get hit, everything gets disturbed. If you have activatable ability, you can still like protect yourself with defense and stuff. You just can't. You just have to use your action to do the thing and then cast it. So let's try it. Let's just try to attack the cultist with the ice lands. And I think this is this is an important moment. An important moment you can use dramatic dice as well. And you can spend five endurance to get additional dice to the roll. And but only if the group and the GM determines that this is a proper proper place to use it. And now when th this and now when this cultist is reading the spell and Valano notices it and realizes that uh, uh, they have no time to counter the spell correctly, they just try to uh, send an ice knife against the cultist and basically like tries to hit both of the cultist's hands and bind them together in order to stop the cultist from casting the spell. And this is definitely a proper place to add dramatic dice. So we can spend five endurance to add one additional die to the attack roll. So now we will roll with five dice. Here, 35. Here, five endurance spent. So five rolls against the three defense of the cultists. But okay, let's roll the three first again. So five dice for Valano, but let's first roll the defense dice again. Oh, that's that's pretty good. One and five, five. So we have to be ten. That is that is a big defense this time. So the cultist is able to basically jump back behind the boxes, and I could have given actually uh, the cultist a modifier that they are behind behind cover, but I didn't determine that now. So let's just keep this and the. 10 defense is really good. Oh, that was almost great, but not quite. 3, 3, 3, that's 9, then we got 6, and then we got 4. So 9 is the best result, so we couldn't beat 10. So Valano tries to send the ice shot in the situation, but the cultist is able to jump behind the boxes and protect themselves from the hit. And Valano is like, Oh, we're gonna be in so much trouble now. And now the second round starts. I think Takino will use Master Cut again. He knows that in this situation, these enemies have to be dispatched quick as soon as possible. So we can make another Master Cut attack. That leaves us only... Oh, I, I miscalculated last time. We started with 40 Endurance. We used 15. That is 25 already. And now if we use 25, we have only 10 endurance left. That's how it goes. So here we go. 
Five dice against three defense. Let's roll for the coldest defense first. That's pretty good. Six, two, three, and six. So six is the defense. And now Takino's attack. <laughs> One, but two, two, two. That is four twos, which is eight. So we will beat the defense by two. And we have the damage modifier of five, which means we deal 10 damage to the cultists. So, but they have still 10 HP left. So it, it wasn't quite, quite enough this time. Takino basically stabs the blade to the side of the coldest and the coldest just screams in agony, but is not quite beaten yet and still tries to take hit in while still able to do that. And we can jump right into the coldest now. But now it's interesting part. As Takino, we can now try to do a counter attack. Okay. Counter attack works in a way that instead of defending, I will use my attack to try to hit the other attack first. So we will compare our attack results. But whoever wins gets to deal that amount of damage against defense of zero. So it's very high risk, high reward. So I can try to attack the enemy first with my full attack. But if I fail, I have no defense at all. And we will definitely do that now. But I have not enough endurance to make a master cut, so I need to make with regular four dice roll. This is a gamble. This is four dice against four dice. So I will again roll the coldest first to see what we have to beat. Well, not, not terrible. It's five for the coldest, but it's definitely out there. So we have to roll five or higher in order to beat it. Otherwise, if we roll under 5, we will, will take full 5 damage. Oh! <laughs> oh yes! 3-3 three, three and 6-6, six, six. that is 12. This is, basically, this is basically critical in this game when you roll double 6s. So, easy enough to say, the cultist tries to get the axe hit in, Takino just twists the blade inside the coldest and the coldest is like <gasps> and is completely out of the game yeah no chance it was a risk but it was worth taking so that is out of the game as well i want to make this interesting so i will say the spell that the mage, blood mage was casting was actually a supportive spell and they will send this blood magic into the crossbow of their friend. So I would say the next bolt attack will have accurate one. So we will roll now five dice and the damage modifier will go up by two because it was an activatable ability. And that will now go against Takino. So with a damage modifier of five and with the dice of five, let's see how Takino will survive for this. We will definitely defend. Four defense dice. Let's first see what the enemy has to beat. Six. Individual numbers, so six is the highest we got. Ah, oh, that's not amazing. Here we go. Oh, what the enemies... Well, that's not too bad. That's actually perfect. We... So we got six. And enemy got two, two, two. That's six four and six so six six against six even with the upgraded attack takino is able to mat matrix style see this empowered crossbow bolt coming in towards him and he's just able to dodge the bolt and he can feel the corruptive force when the Bolt whooshes by and realized that would have been really bad if the attack would have hit. And now it's Takino's turn. I think Takino will now start to charge his own spell and he starts to create this long ice lance and just shouts to Takino. You take out the crossbow guy, I will deal with the spellcaster. And he uses his giant ice lance spell 
which costs 10 endurance. It is also activation, so it takes one turn for him to create the lands, but it will be with five roll, it will be with five damage, and it will also paralyze the enemy. So it is devastating attack. We go back into the starting round. It's a long distance now. In the rules themselves, distances are not that important in combat and it is assumed that everyone can close the distance within like combat if there are some special circumstances then only the range attack will suffice or you have to do something to reach the enemy before you can attack them for example if we have a fight off in a square and then there is a clock tower and somebody is sniping from the clock tower then you have to either do some actions to get into their face or you have to use a range attacks to hit the clock tower as well but I want some extra intensity. I will make a movement roll with a base of four. And if Takino succeeds, then he still has time also to attack the enemy. But if not, then he stumbles a little bit and is not there quite enough in time to make an attack as well. We are agile, so I will give us one dice to this roll. So we will roll three dice and we will need to get at least four. And we roll two, five, six. Number is six, so that means Takino will get there just fine. And against the crossbow, Takino is basically running, taking his plate to the side and making this, basically this horizontal slash and just tries to cut this cultist in half. This will be a basic blade atta slashing attack. So with four dice. Let's roll the defense first for the cultist. And that is six. And now for the attack. And that is six as well. So that means Sakino is running and makes this horizontal slash. But the coldest is able to basically jump back before the hit gets in. And is now aiming directly between the Takino's eyes with their crossbow. Hmm. These cultists are not stupid. I would say this blood cultists wants to stop Valano from throwing the Iceland's attack. So the coldest blood mage will come here and try to make something. Maybe they maybe the coldest just tries to make this kind of simple like blood spike and just send it towards Valano. And I would say it's not even with an accurate weapon. It's just basic three dice, three attack dice and the three times damage against the Valano's defense of four. Okay, so let's roll the defense again. Valano's. Ooh, that's pretty good. Four, four, four. So Valano's defense is 12 against the coldest attack of six. So yeah, Valano is able to, at this moment when they are preparing the ice lands, they can see the coldest, the blood coldest coming from behind the boxes and tries to send the blood dart to their way, Valano basically just, with the other hand, just makes this frost spell and like slaps the blood nail to the side and just huffs at the blood mage and just says, well, right back at you. And <laughs> now sends the whole freaking Iceland towards the blood cultist. I, I, this is too cool. We can we can determine the crossbow coldest's action really soon, but I first want to see what happens here. So let's take the Valano's attack in this instance. So attack roll of five with the damage of five. Oh, this is, and with paralyzing effect. Let's roll first the defense. That is five. Defense is what? Five. And with five dice. Here we go. That's 12, two sixes again. So with seven, <laughs> with at least seven times five damage, basically Valano just ah, sends the whole, the gigantic ice lands towards the coldest and the coldest is just <laughs> drilled into the wall of this stone structure. And it's just left there completely out of the picture. Is this cultist still trying to be? I think this cultist tries to ex escape. We can ask 
from the oracle will this cultist try to escape in this instance let's see i would say it's very likely that, <laughs> that the cultist will run let's roll for it six likelihood six yes two for now okay yes for now so the cultists will will still try to like basically shoot Takino and starts running over there and he basically I think he starts to like shout for reinforces like over here I need help over here and both Takino and Valano realize that they need to shut this individual down before any reinforces will emerge so they both will get one round of attacks and after that if they don't succeed taking the cultists down then some other aspects might arise so let's roll the ice lance first for Valano. It is four dice against three defense. So let's first roll the defense. We can actually use the same defense for both of these attacks. One, one and three. So three is the defense. Let's first roll the Val Valano's like quick ice lance. This is not the huge one. This is the basic ice lance attack. Oh, and that's already 10. Oh no, 10 minus three is seven. Seven times three is, seven times three is 21. So that is just enough. They have 20 HP of the, these enemies. So Valano is able to see the enemy going. He makes this round circle with the stuff and then <sighs> sends the eye shot away. And basically it just shuts the whole coldest down. Intruder, he and straight into the back, the coldest just takes a few more steps and then tumbles down. Valano comes closer to Takino and just asks, Takino, are you all right? No, Valano, I'm really not. I partially feel like this is our fault. If we would have not messed with the corruption gate within the Tower of Secrets, maybe, maybe the Lord of Corruption would not be this aggressive. No ifs, whats and buts. The Lord of Corruption was going to corrupt our world anyway. It is not our fault. How it could be? We are here to inform them of the attack. If we would have not gone into the realm gate and see what the Lord of Corruption was up to, we wouldn't even know this threat exists. I know you're right. It's just, it sucks. I know it sucks. Losing people always sucks, I know that. But there is nothing we can do for these people in here. We have to keep going. Reaching Brightham is our only chance now. We need to be ready for the Corruption Lord's arrival. This, this was definitely just a scouting group. There will be bigger force coming this way. And I'm quite scared to say, but I don't think it's gonna be only cultists then. The rain is still pouring and it's already withering down the flames of the town. We need some kind of ride. Do you? Do you feel anything? Is there still like carts or individuals that could help us get into Brightham? Or are there any mounts, horses around? Well, I can try. And I think we can use level two arcane magic. So we will use the almost rest of our endurance from Valano. Like basically like project our telepathic ability. Because telepathy level 2 is not strong enough to really like scan a whole area. But if we magnify it using second level of arcane magic, I feel like that could be enough for Valano to really scout out the town and to see if there are any mounts still available or any horses that are still alive. So again, let's make an open check to see how well Valano succeeds. And the better Valano succeeds, the likelihood of them founding something also becomes higher. So we have the telepathy of two, we magnify it by two, and then we take the base two. So we have six dice. Woo. This should be good. Here we go. Oh, yes. Six, six. Six, six, unmatched. Yeah, 24. <laughs> we got the best result twice. 
with this unmatched result. I, I want to reward this unmatched result. And I would say there is like this hidden stable. Valano projects their mind around the town and is basically scanning the whole area. They can also feel the occupying force around the town, like basically leaving and seeing that they have a camp in the nearby forest area. And with, with that magnificent result, I will also say that Valano can see they are building a realm gate. There are these blood mages who have taken the town people hostage, probably used as a sacrifice, and they will create this huge realm gate that will probably bring the rest of the force into, the, into this realm. And Valano just says, while still keeping eyes closed to Takino, they are building, they are building a gate. They really are coming. And also, Valano can detect two animal souls within this hidden stable near the opening area. And in their mind, they can hear this <laughs> the sound of horses, kind, kind of frightened, nervous, unsure of what happens. I found horses. We can use them. We have, we have not much time left. We need to find the force and stop the realm gate from being built. That is our only way to stop the corruption from spreading. We need to leave now. Where are the horses? Valano will take Takino to the horses. They will put the saddles up and they will just start right away riding from Worm Hill into the fortress of Brightham in order for them to muster enough forces that can hopefully be enough for them to make a counterattack against the coldest encampment within the forest and stop the realm gate from being built and hopefully stop the Lord of Corruption spreading his corruption within the trial lands. But that is where we stop today. Yeah, what can I say? I really like this system. I, I really enjoy the simple additive dice pool system. The way the abilities gives you so much narrative control on where you can add those weaknesses, where you can add those abilities. It's just endless. You can put skills in there. You can put experiences in there. You can put spells in there. You can put your ancestry heritage abilities in there. Like it's, it just have dumped down everything into abilities, health and endurance. To me, it works. I, I know that's, that might be like too simplified for someone else. And someone would seem see it unnecessarily too complicated but for me to have this list of options basically and the whole game revolves around them it's just like perfect the combat works really well with theater of mind i enjoy that players can really like it is a game for min maxes as well because you have those perks you have those flaws so you can really min max your attacks to be really special ones and and you can easily make it like if you have those activatable and there are also flaw which is called I think assisted that you need someone else with you to help you do your attack ability so you can basically make like this epic combo abilities where this muscle character will throw this other character into the air where they can make this amazing dive kick so you can make basically combo abilities with other yeah it's it's just cool you, you can see how excited I am about the system, but it's, yeah, it's something that I have been looking for, like being narrative, game, some game elements, simple enough, but still has a lot of options. And that's why I think OVA is definitely perfect for solo. It is so easy to build. Well, we use just basic enemies, but I would create like a special enemy on the spot quite easily as well. Definitely, I highly recommend checking out OVA anime tabletop role-playing game. Even though you are not an anime fan, you don't have to be. It is a solid universal solo TTRPG. Check it out. If you like this video, leave a subscription and join the culinary role-playing guild with getting extra perks and 
ability to vote on what videos I will do next. That's all for me today. Now it's Moro Moro and I hope I see you real soon.